me in welcoming our special guest speaker this morning. Everybody, put your hands together. Dr. Sam is in the house. Thank you. Hello. What's up, brother? Hello, beautiful people. How y'all doing? Our God is good. Our God is good all the time. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not his benefits, who has cleansed you of all your sins and has healed you of all your diseases. He has crowned your head with his loving kindness and his tender mercies. He has saved your life from destruction. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, because he has fed your mouth with good things and he has renewed you on the wings of eagles. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. <laughs> Hallelujah! We're here to praise one name. We're here to lift up one name, the name of Jesus. Stand up with me for one second, y'all. Stand up with me. Yes, 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 yes. This, we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. You can go to a cardiologist. I ain't going to mention no names. You can go to a cardiologist. The cardiologist can give you a medication like furosemide, which is Lasix, which is a PP pill. And then it's got side effects. Because, you know, everything goes, and then potassium goes low, so you have to hand them a potassium pill. And then they get all sick, and then you got to hand them prilos. It's crazy. But when Jesus gives to you, there ain't no side effects. There is eternal life, baby. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's goodness in the name of Jesus. There's favor in the name of Jesus. There's protection in the name of Jesus. There is goodness and mercy, and, and all the days of your life, he'll be with you in the name of Jesus. Oh, oh, so we're going to say that name. We're going to say the name of Jesus. And when you say that name, your body and soul and spirit are going to shake. And the, the sickness is going to just go away. No doctor can do that except Jesus. The depression is going to go away. No doctor can do that. No psychologist say, oh, sit down and tell them about your childhood. Never mind about your childhood. Let me tell you about my Jesus. <laughs> and they got you diagnosed with something, anxiety, and they got you on all kinds of drugs, and they say you're bipolar. I'm going to tell you we're going to take that bipolar depression anxiety out, and we're going to put in Jesus. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. So when you say that name, it ain't like another name, another God's name, which would lead you to hell. This name will lead you to heaven, and it's the only name that's going to lead you to heaven. So y'all ready with me? On the count of three, we're going to say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Three times, back to back. You're going to be healed in the name. Ready? On the count of one, two, three. Jesus! 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 Yeah! Blessed be the name of the Lord. Y'all might even, please be seated. Please be seated. We're here in John chapter 8, y'all. John chapter 8. And we're doing 30 minutes with Jesus. Pastor Terrell did uh, what he did with Zacchaeus beautifully last, last week. Today, it's the adulterous woman. And three weeks, back to back to back, it will be our pastor Dudley. He's back. And he will present the gospel. We're just in love with Jesus, y'all. That's all there is to it. So um, it's going to be a little longer than 30 minutes with Jesus today. That's right. It's the last. Uh, baby, we're going 40, all right? I'm going to be thrown out, but it's all good. So uh, we, to, in order to get into chapter 8, uh, we, we're going to go to t chapter 7. Because it says in chapter 8, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, where are we? What's going on in this place? By the way, I was born on the Mount of Olives. Ain't that a trip? I was born on the Mount of Olives. I grew up on the Via Della Rosa in an Armenian community in Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives is a beautiful place. But what's Jesus doing there? We got to go back to chapter 7 to figure it out. In chapter 7, in verse 35, you'll see that they're in the middle of the Feast of the Tabernacles. The Jewish people had seven feasts, four in the spring 
and they had three in the fall. And this is at the fall time. And the first was the trumpets, and then was the, the Feast of Atonement, which y'all know as Yom Kippur. And then the third one, the last one, was the Feast of the Tabernacles. What was that? Well, when the Israelites, in Leviticus 23, when the Israelites had left Exodus, they, they came out of Egypt, they, the Pharaoh was chasing them, and they're like, God is going to take care of you. And so God did take care of them. And they went to the wilderness only about 12, 11 days, right? No, 40 years. Why? Unbelief. Unbelief will kill you. It'll kill. So unbelief, they, because of unbelief, they got stand, stranded in the wilderness for 40 years. So they had huts at that time, little tents. And so they, in the Feast of the Tabernacles, are remembering that time and saying, God is faithful. God is good. God brought us out of the wilderness. God protected us. So they left the little houses and on their porches and on balconies, they made little huts with their families. And they all got together and celebrated for seven days of just giving God the glory. And in the middle of the celebration, Jesus in 735 stands up and he says, if any man thirst, come to me. From me, if you drink of me and believe in me, out of your belly, out of your heart, out of your soul, will flow rivers of living waters. I mean, in the middle of, it's like somebody in the middle right there standing up and going, I got something to say. And so he got something to say. When Jesus talks, you listen. But the Pharisees were not happy. In fact, in 745, John 745, before we get to here in chapter 8, they got the Pharisees, the leaders of the, the Jewish law, they tell the temple soldiers to go and grab Jesus and arrest him. And they are like so bad, they walk like this, like, huh, we're here to take you out, Jesus. Uh-huh. Yeah, what you think you are? And so, but when they come back, they're like, they don't have Jesus with them. They're just coming back without Jesus. And the Pharisees are, where's Jesus? I told you to go get. And they're like, yo, <laughs> we never heard anybody talk like this. And that's all they could say. How marvelous that when Jesus talked, I mean, in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, in Mark chapter 1, verse 22, when he spoke, he spoke with authority. And no man spoke like him. The spirit of the living God was upon him because he was called to heal the brokenhearted and to preach good news and set captives free and proclaim liberty. To those who are bound. That was Jesus. But the Pharisees hated, hated, hated him. I mean, can you just imagine? There was a man in John 5, 5. And he was crippled for like, crippled for like 38 years. And Jesus just walks by the pool. Bethesda. And he said, be healed. Pick up your mind. Let's go. Can you see the Pharisees? They're like, this man, he, they call him Messiah. And he, uh, he heals a man for 38 years, and he heals him on the Sabbath. And uh, what kind of Messiah won't heal? All and he tells them to pick up the mat. Oh, no, he ain't right. So that's a little bit of Jerusalem for you, <laughs> a little bit of my Tennessee. <laughs> so he ain't right. They're mad at him because the man is crippled 38 years. Never mind that he's healed and he's happy and he can go back to his family. Never mind he's got a new life. He did it on the Sabbath. These people are wacko. Crazy. And so this is what you see over and over and over again. And so now they're coming up with something to just catch them. You know, the little Caesar coin didn't work. Y'all remember that? Uh, teacher, master, uh, um, well, should we pay taxes? <laughs> they're not even real. Who talks like that? But it's on, on TV, on commercial. And uh, if you order this right now, we'll give you crazy. <laughs> Okay, just be real when you do, huh? Just be real. Okay, so Caesar, and he's like, let me see the coin. And he takes the coin and he says, whose picture? And they're like, oh, Caesar's. And he says, render to Caesar's. What is Caesar's? Render to God. What is God? And they, they're just like a nuclear explosion. They can't get him. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they got a plan. Oh, they've been working on this for months. 
This just didn't happen last night. So they're working on it. And so everybody's going to go home in the Feast of the Tabernacle. Millions come down to Jerusalem, and then now they're all going to disperse and go back home. And so they, they're in verse 53 of chapter 7, and every man went to his own house. And in chapter 8, then you see Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives. So he didn't go to a house. Remember, Jesus doesn't have a house. Can you imagine leaving heaven, coming down here? Everybody wants a red carpet. You didn't treat me right. Air conditioning ain't right. This and that. that. Jesus don't have a house because that's not important to him. Houses are important, but eternal life is the greatest thing you can have in your life today. And so Jesus... Jesus is there going to the Mount of Olives. What's he doing there? He's praying. He's praying to his papa. He's communing with him. And, and I'm just going to let you know in Zechariah 14, 4, when he comes back on the second coming, his feet will touch down on the Mount of Olives. And you're like, when is that? Well, the next thing that's happening, y'all, is the, is the rapture. Jesus is coming back to take us home. We got no taxes to worry about. You got no cardiologist to worry about. You got no lawyer to worry about. You got no car that's got all the fumes coming out. You got nothing to worry about. Jesus is coming to take you home. But just because you look so pretty in church don't mean you're going to heaven. But you say, I've been here for 20 years. What are you talking about? I'm talking this. You ain't got the blood, you are going to hell. Oh, I said that word, H-E-L-L. Yes, I did. <laughs> because I want, I love you, I want you to have the truth. In cardiology, somebody dying of a heart attack, I don't just stick an aspirin on their forehead and say, God bless you, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> a little, little apple a day, keep the doctor away. We got to rush him in or her in and open up her heart artery or his heart artery, right? You got to give him the right treatment. So the right treatment for life is Jesus Christ. And he's coming back. And if you don't have the blood, baby, you stuck here. And you're like, I deal with it. You ain't dealing with nothing. If you think 110 degrees outside is bad, but it's going to be hot during the tribulation. <laughs> and it ain't even hell. You turn on the faucet and blood come out. You're like, oh, what's that? And there will be real global warming. And I say real. Y'all feel me? It's going to be real. It's a scorching heat. It's going to take off the skin of people. No dermatologist can put you back. And if you do get stuck because you don't believe what I'm saying today, you're like, nah, that's not going to happen. That's cool. You don't believe me? Just wait. When it does happen and everybody here leaves and you're like, why am I stuck? You missed the rapture, baby. You stuck here? Okay, then there comes the tribulation seven years. I'm going to beg you one thing. Don't take the 666. It's going to be offered to you on the forehand right here, forehead and your right arm. It's going to be offered to you if you do take it because you got to get some toilet paper. If you do take it. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind there. If you do take the 666, it's, you're irredeemable. You will never have a chance to go to heaven. So it's, if you're stuck, pay attention. Then after seven years, Jesus comes back in his second coming. That's the second coming. And he'll stand on the Mount of Olives. It's going to be World War III beyond. It's going to be insane. But we, we're going to be watching. We're like, go, Jesus, go. Go, Jesus, go. And, and he's going to shut down the one world government. And he's like, poof. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. And then... And early, early in the morning, he came again to the temple. I love that. Yeah, early in the morning. And it's like Psalm 88, 13. David is speaking to God, and he says, early in the morning, may my prayers rise up to, to God. I like that because you know why? Because a, a lot of Christ followers on the couch, after they watch all the TV and all the crazy, crazy news, cause they're like, oh, I'm so scared. I'm so scared. You're scared because you're watching the wrong thing. Uh, you tripping because you listening. Uh, you want to not to trip? You better get yourself in here. That's how you do. So uh, uh, everybody's tripping out. And, and, and they're in the couch after they scared themselves to death and wondering why they have nightmares and they got to go to the psychologist and everything like that. But never mind. They're sitting on the couch and they're like, dear Jesus. And they're not even praying because you, you just spend your whole day f doing foolish. Yeah. Jesus wants you when you're awake, alert, and oriented. He wants you sober. 
He wants you when you're strong. He wants the best of you. you. We talk a lot about tithes. How about your time? Give him your time. And let me give him my time. No, give him your life. Let him do something good. Oh, something beautiful in your life. So he came again to the temple in the morning, and all the people came to him. The people were attracted to him. There was something different. He spoke in authority, but not only in authority, he spoke in love. Wow. He's a beautiful Jesus. And he sat down and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him. Who are the scribes? They're like the professional Xerox machines. They like take the, the law and they copy it. And, and they know the law from A to Z, Z to A. And who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees enforce the law, right? They're like, well, we think this is what should happen. And they enforce. Everybody was scared of him, man. They looked at him. They're like, ooh, that's a Pharisee. Don't look at him. Don't. Oh, but if you do look at him, you know, bow a little. They, they I mean, rule the land, them and the Sadducees all together. But they brought him to, to Jesus, a woman taken in adultery. She was caught in adultery. And when they had set her in, the, they set her in the midst. I mean, they're just dragging this woman half naked. They're like, come here. And then she's like, no, don't. And they're dragging her. And, and I mean, she would rather dig a hole and just die because this is beyond humiliation. And she knows what's coming next. It's actually death being stoned to death. And so they put her in the midst. And this is a huge thing, right? And by the way, can I just say about uh, some of your Bibles, whether they be NIV or whatever it might be, it may say that this document is not found in some of the early manuscripts, right? That's what they say. I'm taking you back to one of our early fathers of the church. His name is Augustine. In 369 AD, he said this, I have seen with my own eyes scribes who purposely omitted these 11 verses because they thought that Jesus was too lax on sin. So it's purposely taken out. What I'm talking to you is the infallible, the immutable, the indestructible word of God. It stands. Everything else falls. This word will always stand. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So they, they got this woman and they put, put him in the midst, right? Now, now this is horrible. If you go to Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, 37 AD to 100 AD was his life. You will see in his writings, and then you will go to another man in the 1800s, Edderman, another Jewish scholar who became a Christian. You will see in their writings that when they brought the man and the woman, y'all notice the man ain't here? They just got the lady. I'll go there. Hang on. So they just got, they, they just brought this lady. But you know, in those days, they would bring a box, a wooden box, they'd make it. They would put the people caught in adultery in the box. They would fill the box with cow manure, at least up to their knee. They would stone them to death in front of the public square. And they would make sure when they fall in the death, that they would fall face down first in the mud. Then they would take a tree and they would plant the tree. And they would make that tree grow. And that, those, that's their burial site. And you know, years later, li, uh, little Georgie got walking with his mama. And Georgie like, mama, what's that? What's that tree doing in the middle of the square? And she like, hush, child. And she, no, mama, what's that? Hush. And then he keeps on Johnny like, what's that, mama? And mama finally says, okay, this is what happened in the square. Two people got caught in adultery. They got stoned to death. And this is where they're buried. And the tree grows. And, and the fear of God just falls on Georgie and the land. The fear of God needs to fall in America and the world today. The fear of God needs to fall in me and you today. So when we talk and when we walk and when we do, we like, no, I don't go there. I'm under grace but I love my Jesus. I don't go there because of the fear of God. So it, it was an awful thing. She knows what's about to happen. She, she just sees it, foresees it. She's crying out. And then they say to him, the Pharisees and the scribes, Master. I mean, it's like, Master. They don't care about him. You know what Master means? It's rabbi, teacher. 
They don't care about him. You know, this is so interesting because in, in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, y'all know him, Nick? I call him Nicky. And so, Nicky at night, so he's there with Jesus Christ. He's talking to Jesus, right? And he says, Rabbi, Master, I, you're a little different. There's no man that talks like you, walks like you, does what you do, you heal, you, you must be from God. You know what Jesus says to him, the first thing? He says, Nick, you must be born again. Straight out, you're like, I don't get it. You know what he's saying? Before you call me master and teacher, you need me as your savior. Amen. John the Baptist, in John chapter 1, verse 29, it's like John the Baptist sees Jesus Christ and he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. His disciples were there. They didn't follow Jesus at that time. The next day, John says the same thing. He says, behold the Lamb of God. The two of disciples accept him as the Lamb of God, follow Jesus, and then call him rabbi. Before you get to rabbi and teacher, you got to go to the Savior. And I'm going to tell you, all the gods in the world put together can't save you, can't save nobody, can't save nothing. Only Jesus saves. There is no name under heaven that's given to mankind that can save anybody except Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, there's only one way to go to heaven, and there are many, 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 many ways to go to hell. Just remember, only one way. Jesus Christ. He said it, John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. So they're saying to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in, in verse 4, in the very act. This is sick because you had to have at least two witnesses at that time, according to Deuteronomy 19, 15, to watch the whole thing so that the two witnesses can say that this happened at this time and this place. And that's sick. So you have at least two witnesses watching the whole event. They said, in the very act. And now Moses in the law, in verse 5, commanded us that should, such should be stoned. But what say you, master? Oh. Now these boys, they're just like smug. They're like, <laughs> we got this man. I mean, we cut him good. We, there's no way he can get out of this situation. They're like fist bumping each other. <laughs> you bad boy. They're like, nah, you bad. And they're like, this man, he's a sucker. And uh, they don't know this man in front of them is God. And so they're all happy amongst their little selves, and they're celebrating already of what is to come. And you know, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, y'all remember what Jesus said? He said that I have not come so that I may abolish the law, destroy the law. I have come that I may fulfill the law. So if he says, don't stone her, he just made, he's not a friend of the law. Don't stone her. Wow. So they, they're like, ah, oh, checkmate if you play chess. So they got him. Okay, but, but it goes on and on. And, and what did they say to him? But what say you in verse 5? In Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, Jesus is known as the friend of a sinner. And in John 3, 17, y'all know 16, John 17, it says, For God did not send his son, begotten son, only begotten son, so that he may condemn the world. He sent his son so that he may save the world. So now he's a savior, a friend of a sinner. And if he says, stone her, he's no longer a friend of a sinner. And they got him. They're like, check me. And so now... Rome, y'all remember Rome at that time, right? What did they say to him again? I'm going to go back to it over and over again. And they said in verse 5, what say you? John 18, 31. They're going to, six months later, they got Jesus. Not because they're smart. They got Jesus because he laid down his life for you and me. That's why they got Jesus. He did it himself. He gave himself for you and me. So they got Jesus six months later. They're going to crucify him. But before they kill him, you know what they say amongst themselves, John 18, 31? They're like, oh, we can't kill him. No, we, we good. 
We don't kill. We got to go to Rome. So Rome took away their capital punishment around 1 AD, said you cannot kill except if you go through Rome. So they're like, we got to go to Rome. So if he says stone her, he's not a friend of Rome. He's not a friend of the law. He's not a friend of the sinner. And he's not a friend of Rome. He is caught. Checkmate. You're out. They're smug, smug, smug. Ooh, laughing within, going, ah, we came and did what we got to do. We did it, boys. We did it. Okay, so we go on. And what do you say in verse 6? Yeah, just one thing. Can I just say one thing? It just hit me. Um, Here's the created trying to take out the creator. That's crazy. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 14. Who has given you the wisdom and understanding? Who can come against you? Who can teach you, God? Nobody. Not your little opinion, not my little opinion. God is God. And this is the created trying to take out the creator. It's fascinating. And this, they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. That's why they're here. They don't care about the lady. They don't care about her life. They don't care about her, whatever she's got. They don't care about her family. They don't care about nothing. They care about themselves and they care to kill Jesus. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. There goes your rap song. Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. <laughs> As though he did not hear them. And so this is the first time we're seeing Jesus stoop down. This is the first recording of Jesus ever writing. And it's the only recording that we have that Jesus wrote. And we don't even know what he wrote. But I'm gonna tell you, because I'm crazy like that. Tell you. <laughs> so y'all gotta wait a second. So he stoops down and he's right. Isn't this neat? Because you would think he'd look at the woman and the normal person. It was like, man, that's trashy, girl. And then he'd be looking at the Pharisees like, I know why you're here. You're trying to take me down. I just have poof like that. I'll take you out like a nuclear warfare. But no, Jesus is so cool, calm, and collected because in John 14, 27, he's about to die. His, uh, Peter, all these people are going crazy, the disciples, right? But he's calm. And you know what he says to them in the middle of it? He's about to die. Not 911, oh, Father, what I'm going to. He's like, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I don't, I don't give it to you like the world gives don't let your hearts be troubled, nor let it be dismayed. And I say the same to you today through the word of God. I know you're going through a lot today. I know you think you made a lot of mistakes. I know you might feel like this adulterous woman, but peace has been given to you in the name of Jesus. Don't be going around, oh, where's my peace? Where's my peace? Your peace is in here, baby. It's not in the television. The peace is gone because you're listening to the television. Christian acting like rigor mortis. <laughs> Riggy mortis. You are alive in Jesus. If you got Jesus, you are alive. Don't be acting like a fool and acting like the world. The world can act like the world, but you act like Jesus because you got peace in the midst of the gas prices, in the midst of the craziness going around. You got peace. Amen. So Jesus is stooping down, riding on the ground, and they're like, so when they continued asking him, like, uh, okay, Jesus, what you gonna say now? <laughs> what you gonna say? They think he's stalling. Jesus ain't stalling nothing. He is not looking at them. But they continue to badger and badger and badger. So when they continued, I love this, he lifted up himself. Now, take a listen to that word because we're going to go there in a minute again. He lifted up himself. He got up and said to them, he that is without sin amongst you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, not even looking at. I'm going to take you to Exodus to tell you what he wrote. Y'all ready? I'm going to take you to Exodus chapter 19, verse 10. The Israelites have escaped Egypt. They've escaped Egypt. They've gone through the Red Sea. Now they're in the wilderness. They're going to get stuck there for 40 years. Why? 
unbelief. And unbelief will, I'm telling you, kill you. So unbelief, go to belief, not unbelief. But unbelief, 40 years stuck. God, listen to this word, descends down on Mount Sinai. And the, the, the mountain is shaking and, and, and there's thunder and lightning and, and the people are just trembling and they can't, they can't handle God's presence and God comes down. And you literally have to go all the way to Exodus 31 to figure out what happened from Exodus chapter 19. And so, so remember, he's stooping down, right? In Exodus 31, you see that God descended down. He took the tablets, two tablets, and he wrote down the Ten Commandments. Okay, that's what happens in 31. In verse 32, or chapter 32, Moses comes down with the tablets. This ain't a tablet, but just imagine. So he got two tablets, and he comes down, and he sees what he sees. People are dirty dancing. They're drunken. They're committing idolatry, adultery. They got a golden calf, and they're like, oh, golden calf. <laughs> you brought us out of Egypt. You stupid. <laughs> you know God's hand. Was there a golden calf going in the midst of the Red Sea? No, the Holy Spirit opened that Red Sea. And they're like, oh, golden calf. <laughs> we said, thank you. Medical term? Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> So Moses got the two tablets in his hands and he turns into this incredible hulk and turns green and, ah, and just casts the, the tablets down and breaks them. That's in 32. Now in 34, God calls him back up to the mountain. Watch this. Second time, God descends down, gives him the tablets, and in verse 5, 34, 5, he writes the law. Again. So when Jesus is stooping down, I believe not only is he writing, but he's like writing, Thou shalt not have any other gods before you, slash guilty. And the first man that's there, the first man that's there, he's got the rock. He's going to throw it at this one. I mean, he just wants, he's ready. He is the leader of the pack. And all of a sudden, just like God descended on Mount Sinai, and the mountain shook, and the people were like, no, this man's body is starting to shake. He's starting to perspire, and he knows in his heart that he has other gods before him, and he wants to throw the rock, but he sees the word guilty because the Holy Spirit comes, swoops on the ground, takes what Jesus is writing, And goes to his heart, and he said, guilty, I'm, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. And he, he's got to throw the rock. He's got to throw the rock. And then, thou shalt not have any idols before you. And, and the second guy in charge is ready to throw, and he goes, I've got idols in my life. I, I can't, I, I want to, I can't, do, I, I'm, I got to go. I got to go. And the third one, thou shalt not take the Lord God's name in vain. And, and the guy is ready, to, but he's like, I've taken God's name in vain day and day out. I, I'm guilty. I, the Holy Spirit is in their soul, and he's got to throw the rock. And the fourth guy that's there, obey the Sabbath. And he goes, I preach about the Sabbath. I talk about the Sabbath. I tell the people, I make them miserable on the Sabbath, but I don't obey the Sabbath. I'm, the Holy Spirit <laughs> gets him, and he's like, I can't, I can't do this. I, I can't. And then, and then the fifth guy, obey your parents, and he's a big leader, but he hates his parents. He's like, I don't need you. Get out of my sight. Get, I, 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 taught, I teach the law. Who are you? He's like, I disobeyed. I, I I have not been a good son. I've not been a good son. So he has to throw the rock down. And, and the sixth guy, thou shalt not murder. And the Holy Spirit's going, man, you came here to kill not only this woman, but you came here to kill Jesus. And he's I mean, shivering down his spine. And just like the God descended, he's got to throw down the rock. And then the seventh, 
thou shalt not commit adultery. The guy that was there that was supposed to be with this woman, he was supposed to get caught with her who got away scot-free. He's there and he got paid and he knows it that he did wrong and he said, I'm guilty, I'm guilty and he's got to throw the rock. Thou shalt not steal. <sighs> the guy who stole money from the temple to give to the guy so he can have adultery with that woman so that two witnesses can see he's there. And he's got to throw away the rock. Thou shalt not lie. The two witnesses that were in the very act of watching sick, sick, they're watching, they're lying, and they're like, I'm the liar. I'm the liar. They had to throw away the rock. Thou shalt not covet. <laughs> and one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, put down the stone. Walk on home. Shut your mouth. But Jesus didn't say that. I did. <laughs> Walk on home. One by one they leave in verse 9. And then in verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself. Oh, second time. When Jesus lifted up himself. This is for you. John chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus talking to Nikki. And he says to him, as Moses lifted up the snake on the pole so too the Son of Man must be lifted up. Why? So he can say, I'm beautiful, I'm here? No. He can be lifted up on the cross to die for you and me. He must be lifted up. No other man could be lifted up. Even here in John, same chapter, John 18, 20, John 8, 28, then said Jesus to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he. Who he, the Messiah, then shall you know. And he said to her, woman, and you're like, wow, that's rude, calling her woman like that. You know, he called his mama woman in John chapter 2, verse 4. Even on the cross, he's like woman to her. In those days, when you said woman, it was a term of endearment. It was respect and honor. I mean, he could have called her many names. But he loved her, and he called her woman. Nobody else called her woman. He did. He says, where are your accusers? You know your greatest accuser is Satan. He in your mind. He's like telling you, you're a loser. you no good. You went to church. Oh, and in the parking lot, you honked your horn. I saw that. <laughs> He's always in your mind. You shouldn't have said that. You know, Christians don't say things like, you know, I don't, I feel condemned, I'm so bad. Always, he's doing that. And it's, uh, you got the verse, right? It's Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. He is the accuser, day and night. So as Satan is accusing you constantly, Jesus is interceding for you all day long. <laughs> Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said to him, no man, Lord. Wow. You notice that? You notice she called him Lord? She didn't call him rabbi, teacher, prophet, great man. She straight out called him Lord. Now, why would she call him Lord? Because I believe when... <laughs> when he was down on the ground and he was writing. Not only was he saying guilty to those who are self-righteous, but he looked at the woman's eyes and she looked at his and there was just love flowing out of him. Not condemnation, not judgment, but love. And when she looked at his eyes, she said, I've never, I've never seen such purity in my life. I've never seen such goodness. I've never seen such beauty and perfection 
and grace and love. I've never had anyone to accept me like this in my situation when I should have been stoned. But he has set me free. So she skipped all the rabbi master. She straight up went to Lord, God, Jesus, Messiah. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Did you see the order of that? Most Christians live with sin no more. And I'll, I won't condemn you. Do righteously. Don't you mess up in that parking lot. Somebody cuts into your lane, don't you honk that. Don't, I, don't do that. And I won't con- No. No. The order is, I don't condemn you. I'll take you as you are. Go sin no more. You think that lady sinned again? I'm sure she did. Not in the same way. But all of us have sinned, and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He who had no sin, Jesus Christ, became sin, so that you and I may become the righteousness of God in Christ. He loves you so much today that he was willing to die for you. You see, Jesus Christ, six months later, would go on the cross. You see the balance? He is full of grace, yet in John 1.14, he's also full of truth. When we are tolerant to sin, we are not biblical. Call sin, sin. It is not an affair, and it is not a fling. It is what it is. It is sin. And Jesus called it a sin, but he didn't condemn You know who condemns you today? Satan, in your mind, constantly. You loser, you dum-dum, you did this. And you're like, you know, that's right. I did that. I must be dum-dum. And he keeps on telling it. That's another medical word, (laughs) dum-dum. I know I did. Yes, I'm I'm a loser. I'm dumb. I can't do this. Satan, I'm going to tell you something about Satan. He don't belong in your mind. He belongs under your feet. That's where he belongs. I'll take you to one more tree. One more tree. One more tree. Not the tree in the center of where they were and stoning people. But I take you to the tree of Calvary. Where Jesus Christ died for you and me. Do you know he not only did that for you, but he also did it for his papa? You know that? You're like, how? He did it for you and me so that our sins will be taken away. But he did it for his papa because his papa is righteous and holy. And the law is righteous and holy. And someone had to pay the price for breaking the law. And because you and I can't do it, Jesus did it for us, for his papa, so that you and I may have life eternally. Amen? This is a depiction of what Reich um, drew in the 1800s. And it's a chess game. You have the Satan with the green on the left side. And you have this man who's pondering on the right side. The man is you and me. Devil has actually made it look like he's won. And he's actually said checkmate. That means you're down. You lost. You're going to hell. Get out of my face. You can't do nothing about yourself. But you know, if you know the game of chess... This little angel's there helping him while the little spider's trying to bite him and talk to his mind with all those cobwebs in his mind. This man has one more move. His king can take out the whole thing on the other side. I want to tell you today, you have one more move. And the king, Jesus Christ, walks with you. Don't put yourself aside. Don't dig a hole and bury yourself. Don't try to get accused. Don't get condemned. You know what condemnation is? Condemnation is when you are forced to look at the problem and yourself. While conviction by the Holy Spirit is you are forced to look at the solution 
and Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does for you. Today, I want you to know Jesus loves you no matter what you've gone through in life or what you're going through today. And today, I want to be very bold with you. I'm bold because I love you. I've said over and over again, a cardiologist seeing a person with a heart attack can't stick an aspirin on somebody's forehead and then say, I'll see you tomorrow, baby. You have yourself a good 24 hours. You got to take that person to the cardiac cath lab and open up the heart artery right then and there or they'll die. So I'm going to tell you this. Are you ready for the rapture? Are you bought by the blood of the Lamb? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Are you playing this chess game and losing? Or are you playing a chess game going, I don't care what you say. I got the king on my side. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. If you are unsure, I want you to be bold. Crazy bold. Not just bold. No, no, timid, timid, timid. Hey, baby, when you stand in front of the great white throne... <laughs> Ain't nobody going to help you. You are one-on-one -on -one with Jesus Christ. Those are for the people who don't know Jesus. If you don't know if you're going to heaven, if you don't know you're going up with the rapture, if you don't have the blood of Jesus and you're like, my life is messed up, stand up right now. I'm going to pray for you. Be bold and stand up. Don't be scared. You're amongst friends. Ain't nobody going to throw rocks at you. We're going to love you. Stand up. Stand up if you don't have Jesus. That's right. Thank you. Stand up. Amen. Be bold. Be bold. This might be the last time you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I see you. 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 I see you up there. Beautiful peoples in the balcony. I see all of you. I see you. I see all of you in the balcony. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you, family. I see you. I see you. Stand up. Don't sit. Don't sit. We're going to pray. You're going to get the blood of Jesus to fall over you right now. You got the king of kings with you. You're going to put aside all the nasty accuser's tongue and say, get out of my sight, Satan. You ugly. My Jesus is beautiful because I looked in his eyes and I saw love for the first time in my life. So Christians, I want y'all to pray with us here so you will help these beautiful peoples. I'm going to say something. Y'all say it right back. We're going to go to the throne of heaven right now. Say it with me. Father God, I thank you that you are the lover of my soul. And you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. And Father, right now, I am experiencing the blood of Jesus falling all over me cleansing me, taking out all my sins, all my iniquities, all my diseases. And Father, I thank you that you did not leave your son on the cross, but he rose on the third day, and now he lives in my heart through the Holy Spirit. And I am your child, and I will see you face to face. And I am so thankful, Papa. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. We have, amen. Amen. <laughs> Woo, blessed be the name of the Lord. We have beautiful counselors to my left, to your right. If you've prayed, please come up with them and talk to them. They will lead you, help you, direct you, get you to come to church and read your Bible. God bless you. God keep you. God shine his face upon you. God be gracious to you. God turn his face towards you and give you his shallow peace. Amen and amen. I'll be in the front later on to meet and greet you guys. I love you all.